Good afternoon. Welcome to Chuck's series of CPD accredited talks uh, on the different childhood cancers. Um, my name is Audrey Ludic. I'm the program development manager for Chuck Childhood Cancer Foundation. And um, it is Chuck's mission to support children with cancer and teens um, with cancer and life threatening blood disorders um, and their families, improving early detection and facilitating um, effective treatment. CHOC offers comprehensive child and family support through psychosocial, emotional, and practical support. To learn more about um, CHOC's programs of support, please visit our um, website on www.choc.org.za. As part of CHOC's Awareness Training and Education Program, we are hosting monthly CPD accredited talks on the different childhood cancers and the early warning signs thereof. We believe that early detection saves lives. These CPD accredited talks um, on childhood cancers are in line with the global initiative for childhood cancer with the goal of reaching at least 60% of survival rate for children with cancer by 2030. Every 27 seconds, someone somewhere in the world is diagnosed with blood cancer or a blood disorder. Unfortunately, there are only one in 100,000 chance of a patient finding a match, making the need for donors crucial. Denot donating um, blood stem cells is non-invasive, it doesn't require an operation, anesthetic, or incision. Becoming a donor is completely free as there are no costs involved at any point of the process. For more information um, on how to become a blood, cell, uh, um, blood stem cell donor, please contact DKMS Africa um, on their website. Now today, Dr. Jasmine Gogar is, a, is the Senior Specialist in Pediatric Hematology at the Department of Pediatrics at Incorsi Albert Lutuli Hospital. And she's the Honorary Lecturer at the Department of Pediatrics at the University of KwaZulu-Natal. She's trained as a clinical hematologist and uh, she also completed a diploma in pal pal palliative care. She's also a member of various organizations and committees and is currently the deputy chair of MASAC. Jasmine um, has supported CHOC over the many years and has been a keen advocate um, for improving support for children with cancer. We are very honored uh, to have you as our speaker today, Jasmine. And please welcome Dr. Goga as to do the presentation on life-threatening blood disorders. If you have any questions, please put it in the chat and Dr. Gogol will respond after the presentation. We'll give a chance just to um, share a screen. Uh, welcome Dr. Gogol and over to you. Um, hi, Audrey. Um, hi to everybody um, who's joined in. And thanks for making the time to actually um, spend the hour with us. Um, it's quite a daunting topic that I've been given, um, and it's actually impossible to cover the breadth of life-threatening disorders. So what I've chosen to do is just to focus on a few issues, and hopefully these are the pearls that you can take home with you. 
Um, so I've decided to do this just with a few patients in mind, because I find personally that it's easier for me to learn and for me to remember patients in this way and conditions and management. So our first patient is patient DW. He was a 10-year-old from northern KwaZulu-Natal, and he presented with epistaxis, bruising, and fever. He had been a previously well child. He was well grown, an active boy, strappy muscles, he had no dysmorphism, but he was pale. Um, he had wet and dry petechiae. He had no significant hepatosplenomegaly or lymphadenopathy, and there was no bone pain. His FPC showed an HP of six with the normal chromic normocytic anemia with an MCV of 85. He had a low white cell count of 2.3. His absolute neutrophil count was extremely low at 0.2, and he had an absolute lymphocyte of 1.7. His platelets were seven. So in summary, he had a normal chromic normocytic anemia, a leukopenia with a severe neutropenia, and a thrombocytopenia. Review of his smear showed that this was a true thrombocytopenia and that there were no blasts. The next patient, and I just want to compare these two patients as we approach the topic of aplastic anemia. So the next patient was patient ZD. So she came to us at age five. She was initially diagnosed as a golden heart syndrome. She had developed thrombocytopenia at the age of four. And this had actually progressed to a transfusion dependent anemia. Um, on examination, she was short. She had a triangular face with low set ears, she had no hepatosplenomegaly or lymphadenopathy. If you compare her results, so the first lot being done in July of 2019, her HP then was 7.1. In April, it had dropped, um, of this year, it had dropped to 4.1. Her platelets in 2019 were 21, dropped to seven, and her white count two years ago was 7.1. Um, and now it had dropped further to 3.1. However, the absolute neutrophil count had been maintained. So what is our approach to pancytopenia? As you can see, both of these patients show pancytopenia. One is a newly um, diagnosed child, uh, acute history, and the other one shows some progression of disease. What's important is a detailed clinical history a detailed medication history, as well as environmental exposure, to take particular note of any dysmorphic features. And it's also really important to look at the family history. And this must not just be about transfusions or bleeding or anemia, but one also needs to look at malignancy and autoimmune disease. Given the extent of HIV and TB that we experience, this is always critical to, to include in history, and we need to look at growth parameters. Um, the presence of lymphadenopathy and hepatosplenomegaly makes one suspect more of a leukemia, so it's always critical to review these as well. So what these two cases show, especially the second case, is that you might have an isolated cytopenia, which may then progress to a pancytopenia. What I'm showing in this picture is you can see this is a peripheral blood smear, the anemia is quite apparent. There are very few red cells. These are your red cells. And usually you would expect far more of them in the slide. There's a single lymphocyte and very few of the platelet counts. This is actually what a trephine would look like in this kind of patient. And where this should all be full of cells, you can actually see that the cellularity is markedly decreased and it is replaced mainly by fat. So it's an empty bone marrow. If we look at idiopathic aplastic anemia, what we usually find here is that you have trilineage. So all three cell lines are low, and that's due to absent or reduced production of hemopoietic cells, um, usually without any infiltration. In the West, um, the incidence is about two, two per million per year. And the usual question that most parents will pose, and we as clinicians will also ask ourselves is, what has caused this? In 70% of patients, it's idiopathic. We will not find a cause. 
In 20%, there may be a drug, a chemical, or an infective agent identified. The pathophysiology is that of autoimmunity. And this is due to a cytotoxic clone of T cells which are activated. These T cells then produce cytokines that result in the destruction of the bone marrow stem cells. In terms of the peripheral blood, and this is a starting point, unfortunately in many of our state hospitals, we actually have to phone to request a differential count, or we have to ask for a retic count up front, and we have to chase for smear results. But when you look at the peripheral blood, what you will usually find is a pancytopenia with a relative lymphocytosis and no morphological abnormalities. You've seen the bone marrow picture already. This is a hypocellular marrow, so not enough cells in the marrow because these are being destroyed, body against self, and you find a reduction in all cell lines and the increase in the lymphocytes. So your criteria for a severe aplastic anemia requires at least two of the following peripheral blood findings, a reticulocyte less than 1% after being corrected for hematocrit, an absolute neutrophil count of less than 0.5, and platelets less than 20. Together with the bone marrow biopsy showing less than 25% normal cellularity, or a bone marrow biopsy with less than 50% of normal cellularity in which less than 30% of the cells are hemopoietic. Okay, so we prescribe many drugs throughout the course of the day, okay? Many of those drugs, although we prescribe them often fairly routinely, can result in acquired aplastic anemia. And I just want to point out in terms of the antibiotics that Bactrim, which is a day-to-day -day drug for many of us, is one of the key culprits. In terms of your anticonvulsants, carbamazepine is another um, offending agent. Cymetidine and ranitidine, as well as chlorpheniramine. Okay, so just bear this in mind and look at the importance of the drug history. Um, so the first patient that I presented was the young 10-year-old male who came in acutely. The second patient had been diagnosed with an apparent golden heart at, as a neonate or early on in life. Um, and then she showed progression of her pancytopenia. Um, so when you look at bone marrow failure, we usually put it into two groups. Is it an idiopathic or an acquired congenital bone marrow failure? And then the other group is that of congenital bone marrow failure syndromes. And the ones that we see most of in the congenital group is actually the Fanconi anemia. Um, so Fanconi anemia, as time has gone, there've been more and more genes that have been discovered. We are familiar with them being short, with them having urogenital abnormalities, for example, ectopic kidneys, radius um, and thumb abnormalities. And your diagnostic test is actually increased chromosome breakage um, in response to mitomycin C. Less common congenital bone marrow failure syndromes include dyskeratosis congenita and congenital amegakaryocytic thrombocytopenia. So here, what is actually critical is the genetic testing and most of these diseases are actually autosomal recessive. In terms of treatment for your acquired aplastic anemia, if there are siblings and a full sibling match is available, then bone marrow transplantation is what one should do first. If there are no siblings that are a match, um, one should proceed with immunosuppressive therapy with horse or rabbit antithymocyte globulin. For the inherited bone marrow failure syndromes, bone marrow transplantation is your first choice, but these patients are not that easy to transplant. For example, patients with Fanconi's anemia have impaired DNA repair mechanism, and thus getting them through the conditioning regimen for a transplant is actually much more challenging. Um, it's also important to note that if you've had bone marrow failure syndromes and you have corrected the bone marrow problems, 
you are not actually going to correct all the other problems, for example, the pancreatic abnormalities or the increased predilection to developing solid organ or genital urinary malignancies later on in life in patients with Fanconi's. So what is your immediate management would be to manage bleeding with the transfusion of platelets. Here it would be important to use leukodepleted or apheresis platelets. If there's a severe anemia, again transfuse with leukodepleted packed red cells. In terms of the infection, this is definitely not a time where you wait. Remember that the neutrophil count is actually quite low. So one would need to do a septic screen and commence, commence broad spectrum antibiotics as soon as possible. Patients would then require urgent referral for further management. I'm going to move on to the next focus, which is the thrombocytopenias. So patient TP was referred to us at age 18 months. He was a male and he was an only child. Um, he had been delivered by normal vaginal delivery and they had noted easy bruising at 14 months with extensive wet petechiae. In terms of his FBC, his hemoglobin showed an HB, his FBC showed a hemoglobin of 11, his platelets were eight, and his white cell count was six with a normal diff. Um, as is routine, one needs to look at the smear and confirm that there's no platelet clumping and that this really is a true thrombocytopenia. It's also very important to make sure that there's no dysplasia of the platelets or more particularly the white cells. So patient TP was actually given polygam times two because he had the extensive wet petechiae. He also received numerous steroid pulses, but he had no improvement. Personally, I'm just fascinated by what a platelet looks like and how amazing it is when you look at this little, little fragment that has no nucleus of its own, but it is amazing in terms of the receptors and the interactions with the endothelium. I just want to compare patient TP to the next patient, patient PG. So she was referred to us about six weeks ago. This was a nine-year-old female. Um, she was thin, quite wasted, and she presented with a history of bruising for three weeks. Yes, <laughs> she had a strange history of chewing on betel nut at age nine. Um, this was something that the family did. She also had quite a poor diet with um, intake only of processed food like chicken pops. Of note, there was no fatigue or arthralgia. Her FBC showed a hemoglobin of 8.7 a very severe thrombocytopenia with a platelet count of two, a white count of 7.6, an absolute neutrophil count of 3.6. And the interesting thing on her smear is that there was a true thrombocytopenia. However, there were large platelets and occasionally giant platelets. Her ESR was 67, and her iron studies confirmed that she had a chronic iron deficiency anemia. In addition, it wasn't enough that she just had a platelet problem, but her Coombs was also positive. However, she had had no response to platelets or two infusions of polygap. And I should have put the ANA positivity and the anti-DS DNA positivity as a surprise, but I didn't get down to doing that. So this child was actually a secondary ITP um, who, who was, um, had the thrombocytopenia and the autoimmune hemolytic anemia due to the SLE that she was sitting with. Um, the last patient in my series on thrombocytopenia is patient AC. So he had presented as a neonate with bicytopenia and the family history was very worrying. There were two other children who had died of bleeding at age three months and, and eight months. So this was mom's third pregnancy. Clinically, he had atopic eczema, hepatosplenomegaly, and recurrent bacterial infection. On his FBC, he had a mild anemia with an HP of 
low platelets of 19 and a high white cell count of 30. We worked him up in our immunodeficiency clinic and he had low CD4 counts on two occasions. He also had normal vaccine responses and normal immunoglobulin levels. Mum had developed TB and given his susceptibility, so did he. He would bleed very frequently, unfortunately with severe GIT bleeds, and he required virtually monthly platelet transfusions. When we checked in 2019, he had no 10 out of 10 donors. And at that stage, DKMS was not active because he did have some eight and nine out of 10 donors. He had fulfilled the ESSET criteria for Wiscott aldroff syndrome, and this was confirmed on genetic testing. Unfortunately, he had a massive GIT bleed and he demised. Subsequently, a fourth sibling presented with similar thrombocytopenia and had a similar course, he also passed away. So this mom has unfortunately lost all four children due to wiscott aldrich syndrome. So just to take a step back, when we look at bleeding, um, we think of it in terms of Virchow's triad. We think of platelets, we think of clotting factors, and we think of the integrity of the vessel. I've traditionally taught students to think of bleeding and to come out with some kind of pattern recognition. Is it a platelet problem or is it a clotting problem? And of course, there'll always be those problems that bridge on both sides or fit into neither category. Platelet problems would tend to give you petechiae, ecchymosis, and mucosal bleeding. Clotting factors, on the other hand, would give you more ecchymosis, joint and muscle, as well as mucosal bleeding. Um, the other consideration that we must have is that of platelet dysfunction. And here the key is to look at the history. When does this bleeding actually happen? And in many cases, it occurs post-dental extraction, post-tonsillectomy or other surgical procedure. So let's come back for a moment to our patient with SLE who had immune mediated thrombocytopenia. So this is a condition that you that is the most common platelet abnormality in children. What is it? It's an acute immune mediated condition resulting in platelet destruction. And the incidence is about four per 100,000 children per year. It raises a lot of worries parents become distraught, um, as do several doctors, especially when faced with things like conjunctival bleeding, okay? But the reality is that 80 to 85% of patients with ITP will have a spontaneous remission within a few months. However, 15 to 20% of them will run a chronic course of more than 12 months duration. And these are the ones that we tend to see in terms of the pediatric hematology clinic. This is usually two groups of patients. One is in the younger child, and then you get a second peak in terms of the young adults. And girls, unfortunately, are more frequently um, affected compared to boys. There have been some changes in the nomenclature. Okay, um, So we have three groups. The first is your newly diagnosed ITP. And here you look at whether remission occurs before three months, this accounts for 50 to 70% of patients. The next group is your group of persistent ITPs. Here, the time frame is between three months to one year. And then your last group, which is much more difficult to treat, is that those with chronic ITP, where the symptoms persist beyond a year. So it's always difficult um, for parents to accurately quantify exactly how much bleeding there is. And we can understand this. Bleeding is very, very frightening for most people, okay? Um, but I think it's really important for us to have some kind of grading system for your ITP or any type of pet patient with bleeding. So patients with ITP, we usually grade them mild, moderate, severe, and life-threatening. For those with mild, you would usually have few petechiae and small, meaning less than five centimeter bruises, 
your epistaxis is stopped with applied pressure within 20 minutes. Moderate, these patients have more fatigue and larger bruises. Their epistaxis takes longer than 20 minutes to stop. And they also have intermittent bleeding from the gums, the lips, the buccal or oropharynx, or the GIT. Remember that girls, unfortunately, are more affected by ITP than boys are. So things like menorrhagia become a very real problem. Here, if you have menorrhagia, hematemesis, hematuria, melina, the critical point is that you don't have hypotension and you don't experience a drop of more than two grams. In those with severe symptoms, this is epistaxis requiring nasal packing or cautery, and this is what we struggle with because it's very difficult for these children to eat and drink while they have these plugs in. It's smelly, they look frightening, they are afraid, okay? Um, here you may also have continuous bleeding from the gums, and you would also worry about internal hemorrhage. Um, if you have hypermenorrhagia, hematomesis, this would result in hypotension and a fall in your hemoglobin of more than two grams per liter. The last group is life-threatening, okay? And these are patients with intracranial hemorrhage or continuous or high volume bleeding resulting in hypotension or shock with prolonged capillary refill needing fluid resuscitation or transfusion. So mild, moderate, severe, and life-threatening Critical thing is, is your hemoglobin falling? How, how many petechiae do you have? How large are your bruises? Where are you bleeding from? Can it stop? Is it ongoing? So in terms of the clinical features, typically a child with newly diagnosed ITP would present with a short history of easy or spontaneous bruising or mucosal bleeding, and generally they are well. They may have had a viral infection in the preceding two to three weeks, and sometimes as far back as about six weeks. And this is usually seen in children that are more than six months of age. Um, it's important to note whether there's any bone pain present and whether there's any previous bleeding history. Atypical features in a child with bruising or bleeding would include a much longer history, if you have a presentation before the age of six months, one must think of congenital platelet disorders. And then if you have a family history of bleeding problems, then you must think about von Willebrand's or any other coagulopathy or even more rare things like platelet storage pool disorders. So what's your differential diagnosis? A malignancy? infections. We deal with many children with um, severe sepsis. Non-accidental injury, one must always consider given the society that we live in. A plastic anemia, like you've seen in the case series before. Um, with patients like Fanconi's, you can have an isolated thrombocytopenia, which can then progress. Patients with other autoimmune diseases like lupus, and then you must always think of the drug-induced um, thrombocytopenia. And lastly, things like TTP or HUS. So in terms of management, what do we do with these patients? Um, the general urge, and it's a very, very strong urge, is that these patients need to be treated. And this is actually not always necessary. So one needs to try and look at the risk category. And for me, the critical thing is the age of the patients. So if the patient is under the age of three years, um, I have a higher index to treat. And then I also look at where is the bleeding. If I have any wet petechiae or oral palatal or genital urinary bleeding, then this is a patient that I would want to treat more aggressively. So if you have a low risk category play, um, patient, for many patients, these can be observed, okay? Given our health system, I think we are all a little bit weary and we worry about whether patients can get to us in time. If you have a patient who's got moderate to bleeding, um, then your first line would be prednisone at two milligrams per kg for four to seven days. Your second line, if there's a poor response or if you need a quick 
increase in your platelet count is to give your polygam or IV immunoglobulin. Okay. For those patients with severe or life-threatening bleeds, um, here you would need a combination because you want drugs that are going to work quickly. You want to coat those macrophages with antibodies so that they don't consume the platelets that you're going to give to try and increase the platelets. So you would want to get the polygam and the pulse IV metapred on board first as soon as possible, and then give a platelet transfusion as well. There is also a role for IV tranexamic acid if you don't have any hematuria. Okay, so this is our usual challenge, is that of ITP um, and hip versus congenital platelet disorders. And some of the things that you need to think about is, like in our first, second patient, the 18-month-old who hadn't responded to steroids and IVIG, if there's no response to steroids or IVIG, this is not usually on an autoimmune basis. If you have bleeding with platelets more than 30, think again, what am I dealing with? And then it's also important to look at any associated dysmorphism and peripheral smear findings. So what's critical here is careful review of your FBC, um, making a note in particular of your differential count and asking the lab to please review the platelet size and the platelet morphology. Von Willebrand's with us um, generally, I think in the country is grossly underdiagnosed, um, but this is when you would want to look at von Willebrand's factor studies. And then we are still in many centers now beginning to use more of the PFA, which has largely replaced the bleeding time. So the challenge when you have no response is to think what next? Um, so our patient TP, the 18-month-old, we eventually, I think, did about three bone marrows on him between various centers. And what his bone marrow showed was the absence of megakaryocytes. Okay. So this is a congenital amegakaryocytic thrombocytopenia. It's an autosomal recessive disease due to mutations in the thrombopoietin receptor gene. These patients usually present with severe thrombocytopenia at birth with clinically significant bleeding. And the concern with many of these congenital bone marrow failure syndromes is that there's an evolution, firstly, to bone marrow failure. And then secondly, there's an evolution in many of them to leukemias, particularly the acute myeloid leukemias. Treatment in this case, this is a bone marrow that lacks megakaryocytes. This patient is not able to produce platelets. So when he bleeds, he requires platelets. Can one live a life in fear all the time? And unfortunately, this is where our patient is. If he has an appropriate sibling match, and now we're getting increasingly brave with unrelated transplants, then this is a patient who would be a candidate for an allogeneic transplant. Okay, coming to the third patient in our series, um, the child and the patient where there were four siblings with Wiscott Aldrich. So Wiscott Aldrich is usually a heterogeneous phenotype. There's variable severity of the eczema. There may be an immunodeficiency due to either humoral and cellular abnormalities. And the key here is the macrothrombocytopenia. So your autoimmune complications include autoimmune associated cytopenias, as well as B-cell lymphomas. There is ineffective thrombopoiesis. So this bone marrow just isn't making enough platelets, and the platelets that are being made are being cleared very quickly. So these are actually um, smaller platelets with large granules, and the treatment is supportive care. So you treat the infections, you transfuse if bleeding. There is only one curative option, and that is an allogeneic stem cell transplant with reduced conditioning. So I just want to mention two other platelet abnormalities. The first is the disorder of platelet adhesion, Bernard Solia. This is autosomal recessive 
And this is usually with giant platelets and thrombocytopenia. So here the key is, is that your thrombocytopenia is not usually very, very severe. So it's around 20 to normal. And clinically, these patients present mainly with mucocutaneous bleeding. How do you make a diagnosis? So you've got the suspicion because it's mainly mucocutaneous. Um, and what you have to do here after you do your FBC, probably do your PFA, your next step is your platelet aggregation studies. And this shows a lack of response to rhizocetin. We can also test for um, the presence of GPA expression, which is usually absent or markedly decreased. With any of the patients with thrombocytopenia who are being given platelet transfusions, there's always the risk of alloimmunization and patients becoming refractory to platelets, which creates another problem altogether. Our last platelet abnormality, and apologies for these teeth, they look quite scary, um, is Glanzmann's thrombosthenia. This is an abnormality of the platelet fibrinogen receptor. There's absent receptor expressions on the platelets. So these lovely, beautiful platelets with their octopus-like arms are meant to be able to attach to other platelets. They're meant to be able to attach to von Willebrand's. They're meant to be able to attach to the endothelium. But in these patients, the docking station is simply missing. So some patients may also have an associated leukocyte adhesion defect. How do they present? A bit similar to the Bernard Solia with moderate to severe mucocutaneous bleeding. However, in Bernard Solia, there was no response to the rhizocetin. In this case, the only thing that they do respond to is the rhizocetin, and there's a decreased response to all the other agonists. Flow cytometry here is helpful and usually a lot easier, and this shows an absent or markedly decreased surface levels of integrin. Again, we face the same problems with the risk of alloimmunization. Um, here, there's a place actually for the use of recombinant factor seven to limit alloimmunization, or if patients are refractory to platelets, and one can actually use transplant as well. So my general approach might seem a bit simple, but I think it still holds me in good stead, is to ask myself three questions about when I'm dealing with bleeding and a possible platelet problem. First, is it a question of quality or quantity? Do I have enough platelets? Or, and if I have enough, then are they working properly? The second is, if I don't have enough platelets and my platelet numbers are low, what's causing the destruction? Is it immune mediated or non-immune mediated? Are there antibodies at play? And then my last question is, is this a production issue? What's the state of my bone marrow? Is my bone marrow making platelets or is it a destruction issue? Are these platelets being made and then destroyed either within the bone marrow or spleen or within a huge spleen, for example, with hypersplenism? So these are my three questions that I always ask when I'm faced with a child with a bleeding disorder. Okay, we're going to move on to a slightly different focus now. And this is patient AN. So he's an 18 month old male. He presented with decreased loss of consciousness um, and there were possible seizures. He also had vomiting and there was no fever of note. In terms of Further history, there was a history of easy bruising. Mom had taken him to the clinic on a few occasions, but this was not investigated further. There was no significant family history on either the maternal or the paternal side, and there was no history of drugs or toxins. So in terms of his investigations, his FBC was normal. He had a white count of 12 with a normal diff happy platelets at 289, and his HB was 9.5. His INR was a little bit increased, but not very, very significant. It was 1.7. His PT was normal, but he had a prolonged PTT. 
the CT that was done as an emergency showed a large intracranial bleed. Factor levels were done and his factor eight level was extremely low at less than 1%. His factor nine was sitting at 70%. So this child was actually a hemophilia A. It was his first presentation to hospital and unfortunately it was with a large intracranial bleed. In terms of hemophilia, this is an X-linked recessive disorder. What does that mean? If you've got a mom in front of you and you're counseling her, and she says to you, my father had hemophiliac, what are you going to say to her? If her father was a hemophiliac, it means that all of his daughters would be obligatory carriers. In this case, there was no family history. So we don't know whether this mom was from a family where they just didn't know there was hemophilia or whether this is a wild mutation. In terms of female carriers, they have a 50% chance of having an affected son or a carrier daughter. In terms of severity, and this is what becomes important. Remember our patient had a less than 1% factor level. So we normally grade hemophilia into mild, moderate and severe. So if you're looking at coagulation in hemophilia, bleeding starts, your usual response, go back to Virchow's triad, is your vessels going to constrict? That decreases the flow of blood because you are losing blood from that area. The next thing is you get the wave of platelets and you're hoping that those receptors are playing the game. The platelets form a plug and then to solidify the plug, you usually get the clotting factors that come in and cause fibrin formation. However, in hemophilia, this does not happen. So you get the formation of an incomplete or delayed fibrin clot and you have ongoing bleeding. What is the epidemiology of hemophilia? So hemophilia is by far the more common of the two and it represents about 80 to 85% of your total hemophilia population. There is an estimated frequency of one in 10,000 births. In terms of the hemophilia A incidence rate, we should be seeing one per 5,000 male births and one per 50,000 um, male births for hemophilia B. In South Africa, given our population of 68 million, we are still underdiagnosing patients with hemophilia because within the country from our registry, we have a total of about 2,500 patients with hemophilia. So we were speaking about the severity of the hemophilia and we looked at whether it was mild, moderate or severe. I just want to remind everybody that a normal factor eight or nine level could be anything from 50 to 150%, okay? In terms of the um, presentation, if you have very severe hemophilia, here you will have either traumatic or spontaneous bleeding, okay? And this is when you have a factor level of less than 1%. These are the patients that keep us up at night, okay? And these are the patients that become increasingly difficult to find lines on. Um, these are also usually the patients that inherit the naughty gene that cannot sit in bed at all, okay? Um, the next group are your moderates. These have less frequent bleeding. This usually follows trauma, surgery, or dental work. However, there are 10% of patients with moderate hemophilia who will actually have a severe phenotypic bleeding type. Okay, so they bleed despite the absence of trauma. They behave like severes. And then this last group, the milds, we hardly ever see. Um, and I think a lot of this is related to the lack of dental services within our country, because these patients usually are diagnosed following um, dental intervention where they have prolonged bleeding. Okay, so this patient, going back to our patient, had presented with possible seizures, a decreased level of consciousness, no fever. Um, and the scan had showed a large intracranial bleed. So he falls in this group with a life-threatening bleed, which usually is about five to 10% of patients. 
by far the patients present with hemarthrosis, and this is about 70 to 80 percent of bleeds. And then the remaining 10 to 20 percent is muscle and subcutaneous bleeding. So hemarthrosis, um, and I just want you to remind yourself that these are children. It's often difficult for them to diagnose, or not to diagnose, for them to explain exactly what they're feeling. So, um, you know, it's important to try and find out in the vernacular what are the, what are the terms that, that are used. Um, and this tingling sensation is, you know, in, in Isizulu, they, they speak about uya bablish, it's bubbling within, so they can feel a different sense. So clinical features would be a tingling sensation, um, joint stiffness, and then this progresses to joint pain. There's on examination, increased warmth over the area um, is an early sign. And then later on, there's limited range of motion. Um, swelling, which is when we usually see them, is actually a late sign. So when I counsel patients, I would usually say to the mums, your child's not going to tell you when something's wrong. As they grow, they actually know if they say that there's something wrong with their knee or their elbow, it's going to mean an injection. It's going to possibly mean an admission. So you need to check. And we, we're trying to find this fine line in terms of balance between being an obsessive mom and just being a mom that's just checking through everything. So usually I say to them, you know, in the evening, when you're dressing, when you're changing into pajamas, just run your hands over all the joints and see that everything's fine. You know, make it into a game, but that's what you do. Okay, so if you look at the hemarthropathy, this is what happens if we don't treat bloods, um, uh, bleeds on time. So you have a normal joint, um, and here you have your synovium, you have your cartilage. With each bleed, the, the actual blood causes destruction of the synovium, it eventually erodes into the cartilage, and um, finally you end up having no cartilage, bone on bone, and this is end-stage arthritis. This is what we actually don't want anything from here onwards. We want to maintain normal joints. Okay, so what happened with patient AN? He was treated with high dose factor VIII for two weeks. He was then discharged after another two weeks, and he was reviewed in the clinic. Our plan for him was to commence prophylaxis weekly with 30 IUs of uh, factor VIII per kg, with a view to building this up to two to three times a week once um, his parents were used to it and once they could sort out things at home. The challenge in an 18-month-old is that of difficult venous access. And he then presented three months later with a left knee hematrosis, which had occurred the day after the infusion. So at this point, we've just given him factor. There's no history of a trauma. There's no history of a fall. Mom said when she woke up, um, he was crying and she noted the swelling in his knee. So here we are always worried about the presence of inhibitors. His inhibitor screen was done. It was positive. And unfortunately, his inhibited teeter was 75 Bethesda units. We have a problem on our hands. What are these inhibitors in hemophilia? So inhibitors are actually immunoglobulin G antibodies. What do they do? They neutralize clotting factors. And basically, it's produced by the body's immune system, antibodies against clotting factors. For most of these patients, they have large gene defects. So when we give them factor, they're not producing any of the bits and pieces that make up the factor eight. So they view the infused factor as a foreign substrate, and they then develop an attack against them. The aim here, or the ultimate um, end result of all of this antibody activity, is that you neutralize the factor activity. So you're giving the factor, you're infusing it after you've gotten that drip in finally, but the patient has many antibody that are actually neutralizing the factor. What is the incidence of inhibitor development? Unfortunately, in severe hemophilia A, 
this is as high as 30%. And it's high, especially in patients of non-Caucasian um, non-Caucasian patients, there's also a significant genetic component. So it runs within families. It's also high in patients who have received large amounts of factor. So patients like this who have presented with an intracranial bleed, for example, these are patients who are at high risk of developing inhibitors. However, it does not mean that patients with moderate or mild hemophilia won't develop inhibitors. They do develop it, albeit at a much lower rate. And then the other side is what happens with those patients with hemophilia B. Because patients with hemophilia B, although the rate of inhibitor development is low, it is far more difficult to treat them. Okay. So one of the things that we will ask most hospitals to do, no matter what level hospital you are at, is a mixing or correction assay, okay? And what this does is that you take the patient plasma, um, you add normal plasma to it, and usually if there's no problems, nothing stopping the coagulation process, um, this clotting factor should be corrected, okay? If, however, there are inhibitors within the patient plasma, it's not going to allow for the clotting to occur, and the clotting time is going to remain prolonged. So this is something that is called a mixing study. It is not something that needs to be sent up to your tertiary center. It is something that can be done at every base or district hospital. Um, and I think it's important for when you have patients with hemophilia that your district hospitals are actually capacitated to be able to do this. So when do you check for inhibitors? Okay, one is if you have a family history of inhibitors, you need to check more frequently. You always need to do it before any elective invasive procedures. In this patient, remember he'd had his factor the day before, the next day he had a knee bleed. So here there's a clinical response which is suboptimal because he should not have bled given that he had some factor on board and there was no trauma. In some centers, there's options of different concentrates and it's always different. Um, it's always important to document that you have no inhibitors before switching to another product. And then usually two to three weeks after intensive treatment. And by intensive treatment, they mean five exposure days, okay? So if you've had a patient with a massive knee bleed or who's had um, gone in for some kind of surgery and has had more than five days of factor, you need to actually check that patient for inhibitor development after two to three weeks. And then as a matter of routine, we do it Every, after every third exposure or every three months, if the concentrate exposure has occurred until 20 exposure days, then three to six monthly until 150 exposure days. Um, after that, one should continue to check at least every six months to yearly. So this is part of the routine workup for um, inhibitors and management of a hemophiliac. So this... I think one of the biggest challenges we face with hemophiliacs is that of CNS bleeds. Um, these can be life-threatening. They definitely do cause permanent neurological damage, and they need to be treated as medical emergencies with immediate hospitalization. I think what's critical is before you worry about anything else, get your bloods done and give the factor. Those things happen one after the other. Line in, inhibitor screen done, FBC done, UNE done, and then give the factor, okay? Um, in terms of clinical features, um, headache that's persistent despite analgesia, signs of raised intracranial pressure, um, lethargy, drowsiness, seizures, and then they progress to loss of consciousness and confusion. Um, so these are the things that when you have a patient with hemophilia, one needs to educate the mums and the entire family. It's not just the mum's responsibility that if there's any of this present, they need to come to hospital as soon as possible. So this is a typical picture of patients that we see. 
Just a reminder again, in terms of the treatment goals, would be to arrest the bleed and prevent further injury, uh, bleeding. Um, you may also get severe or sudden pain in the back, which may be associated with bleeding around the spinal cord. The rule is factor replacement first. Do not wait for the CT. Do not wait for discussion with the hemophilia center. If you know it's a hemophiliac, or if you have a suspicion that it's a hemophiliac because there's a positive family history, patient not previously diagnosed, give either the plasma if you don't know exactly what type of hemophilia it is, or you give the factor. Okay. And your approach is to raise the factor levels to 80 to 100% and maintain it at this level for seven to 10 days. So it's a long duration of treatment. Um, up front, you then need to maintain the plasma factor level at 50% if it's a hemophilia A and 30% if it's a hemophilia B for a further 14 days. Thereafter, one needs to place the patient on prophylaxis. And this is not just for three to six months. This should be lifelong prophylaxis because they have definitely got an increased risk of bleeding again. One needs to involve the neurosurgery and uh, hemophilia teams as soon as possible. And then you perform the CT scan basically at the onset and again at about two weeks post. Um, Anti-epileptic medication is required as soon as the bleed is confirmed. So although many um, centers would advise to monitor factor levels pre and post infusion, this is not always easy to do. Um, so we would say treat, and you can try and do the factor levels, but if you can't, you continue with the treatment. In terms of GIT bleeding, this is the other life-threatening. Um, there's a GIT and the GUT bleeding, so genital urinary and gastrointestinal. So in terms of genital gastrointestinal, this can occur anywhere along the GIT track. One always needs to think about whether you have other problems like angiodysplasia or in adults or older people, um, bleeding peptic and duodenal ulcers or bleeding hemorrhoids. Clinical features would be melina stools, hematochesia, hematemesis, um, abdominal pain or an acute abdomen or abdominal swelling. Again, the, the goal in hemophilia is to stop the bleeding. How do we stop the bleeding? We stop the bleeding by giving factor. So here we arrest the bleed, we ensure sustained coagulation, and then we've got to figure out where is the site of bleeding and what's the cause of it. Um, patients with GIT bleeding need to be admitted. Similarly, one would need to um, increase the factor levels to 100%. Oh, yeah. um, and if there's no dipsticks showing hematuria, then one would need to add tranexamic acid IV. One must not give this with things like fever. You would need to do an upper and lower scope under factor cover to establish the site and cause of bleeding. And there may be a transfusion with red cells that may be required. Um, for patients, older patients, one might need to think about long-term omeprazole as repeat bleeds are common. Genital urinary bleeding, here we may have gross or microscopic hematuria. Um, patients may have renal angle tenderness or low abdominal pain, and there may also be dysuria and features of a urinary tract infection. If there's painless hematuria, this can be treated conservatively to start off with, with complete bed rest, vigorous hydration, if, however, there's pain or persistent gross hematuria, then you need to give factor. You also need to make sure that there's no clot formation causing urinary tract obstruction. So your treatment approach would be to increase fluid intake by two to three liters per day, um, replace factor, not to use tranexamic acid as that's gonna cause clots in your ureters and that's going to be extremely painful. And then you may need to involve the urolog uh, urologist and investigate if the hematuria is recurrent or persistent. Um, so your general principles of management is to prevent and treat bleeding with the specific coagulation factor concentrate. You must always 
remember factor first. So treat the bleeds first if the diagnosis is known before sending patients for further investigative procedures. Treat the bleeds quickly, and I'm going to come to factor administration at home. And then after that, you need to prevent the bleeds, which is where we use primary or secondary prophylaxis. Um, so your general principles of management would be to avoid antiplatelet drugs. This is very important. So no aspirin, no non-steroidals. Avoid all intramuscular injections. Treat those veins with TLC, okay? Don't rush it. Wait, soak hands, be calm, take a deep breath, um, and do what you can so that you have a much better chance of getting into that vein. Okay, it's important to use enough analgesia. And then your adjunct therapeutic measures are important. You must rest the affected limb, apply ice and immobilize, use a compression bandage and elevate the affected limb. So hemophilia is a challenging condition to treat. It needs everybody on board, the nurse, the uh, hemophilia treating physician, Every a medical officer, consultant, um, nurse in the clinic, everybody gets involved. But you also need the physiotherapist, the social worker, and the patient groups to be involved as well. So in terms of prophylaxis, and I'm going to end shortly, um, we started off in the old days giving factor just when there was a bleed. Um, we are now moving to primary prophylaxis, which is a different approach. We don't want to have children with intracranial hemorrhages. We don't want to have children with significant sobus muscle bleeds. So we want to actually start factor replacement, giving them factor um, ideally before the age of three years or before the second clinically evident joint bleed. Okay, um, so... I love this picture because I think it shows you what is possible. And I think this kind of um, series actually needs to be made into a video clip of sorts to inspire other young people that this is possible, okay? So this is a young man who is self-infusing himself. Um, he gets his line in and he's actually able to inject his factor. And this is what we want patients to be able to do at home. Okay, so I'm going to actually end there because um, it is right on five. Um, as I said, it's not possible to cover the breadth of life-threatening emergencies. I think the next session is going to focus on the leukemias. Um, so there will be some discussion of um, some of the critical issues with leukemia presentation and management as well. Thank you very much. I think we will need a follow up on this. This was absolutely excellent. Um, Jasmine, there was a question. Infants less than three months usually have lower factor eight and nine levels. Is there a definite, definite age at which levels must be within normal levels if no underlying hemophilia? Can you quickly okay. answer that, please? Yes, sure, Audrey. Um, so in terms of factor eight, the level that you are born with is the level that is yours for life, okay? So factor eight, even as a neonate, day three, day five, one month, three months, five months, that is your level. If it comes to less than 1%, you are a severe hemophilia. Factor nine is different, okay? So your factor nine does change, and that's why it's always important to go back. It's not only for your factor nine levels, it's also for things like your protein C, protein S. There's a whole range. And these sometimes, especially your protein C and S, will actually only normalize by around the age of three years in some patients. So factor nine, usually by nine months, is when we would do those levels again. And that would be a more definitive time of testing. So I hope that answers the question. Thank you very much. Um, I didn't see any more questions. But um, I really want to thank you, um, Dr. Goga. That was an excellent presentation. Thank you to everybody who joined this webinar today.
If you have any questions or need to refer a child who may have cancer or life-threatening blood disorder, please visit CHOC website. Um, there is a refer a child um, option. And then on the CHOC website events page, you will find information about the upcoming webinars. The next webinar will be um, on the 29th of June, when Prof. Mariana Kruger will present on retinoblastoma. On the 6th of July, Dr. Jock van Heerden will present on neuroblastoma. On National Cancer Survivors Day, the 6th of June, we will host a webinar specially for survivors, and we will focus on nutrition and healthy lifestyle. And please visit CHOC website, as I say, um, to register. All these webinars will be available on YouTube afterwards. Um, unfortunately, only the people who registered um, will get the CPD accreditation. So thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and we hope that the knowledge that you gained today, that you will use that um, to save the lives of children. Thank you so much again, um, Dr. Gaga, for sharing your invaluable knowledge with us. It is much appreciated. On the chat, it, um, there's so many um, messages to thank you and to say it was a brilliant uh, presentation. We, I wish everybody a wonderful day. Thank you so much. See you next time. <laughs> thank, thank you, everybody. Take care. Stay safe. Bye. Bye-bye.